Uh, I share with you this uh, HLP, the global, right? The invitation. Ah.
OK, uh, we'll get started. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're joining us from. Hope you're doing well today. Um, my name's Jim Robinson. I'm the co-coordinator of the Housing, Land and Property Area of Responsibility uh, on behalf of NRC, um, which we co-lead alongside Hewan Habitat. Colleagues are here on Breta, so co-coordination focal point. Um, and we're also joined by Trezor and uh, Eleonora, uh, who are all supporting the global coordination team. So really welcome to you today. Um, I always like to start, if possible, just to say hello. If anyone can put their cameras on, even just for a moment, to just say hello and see who we have here. I fully understand that, you know, sometimes bandwidth and generally we're doing other stuff as well or whatever it is means that we might not have our cameras on. Totally fine. But I just thought it'd be nice to say hello to people who do uh, are in a position to put their camera on for the minute. Um, and uh, yeah, just to say see real people behind the uh, the letters. Oh, it's a good mixture of uh, backgrounds and uh, places. Um, I see some out and about literally in the woods um and some in yes all sorts of various locations but yes lovely to see you all thank you um and you're welcome keep your camera on if you would like or turn it off if you would like up to you um gosh there's a real variety i'm i'm impressed um good so today we are going to um hear from a number of colleagues and, and various updates around things. I'll go over the agenda in a moment. Um, just to mention that we're recording this uh, meeting. We like to share uh, the recording um, on our website and through our newsletter as well. Um, so just bear that in mind. Um, and if there's anything particularly sensitive you want to say or, or communicate, let us know and we can pause that. Otherwise, we'll be uh, recording throughout uh, the call today. Um, you may or may not already be signed up for the uh, AOR's newsletter and updates. Um, I'll just put in the chat the, the details for that in case you're not, um, just to make sure you can find out about uh, what's going on. Um, won't be any spam, it'll just be updates around events, the newsletter, maybe some uh, product launches like, you know, around when people have developed things, uh, but you won't be bombarded, I promise you. And if you want to see the latest edition of the global update that was um, sent out uh, last week, you can click on here and have a look and let us know what you think. And we're always welcome for inputs. If you've got things to share, please go ahead and do it. Um, so I'm just going to start by sharing briefly um, a slide that just has the um, agenda for today, uh, the call. So we're going to hear well, I'm going to mention a couple of upcoming events that we have just to put them on your, your radar in case of interest. And then we're going to hear from colleagues in Afghanistan um, who've been doing some work jointly between HLP and Shelter. Um, you and Habitat colleagues are going to present some work that, that, that's ongoing and forthcoming uh, on uh, working in customary settings, which might be quite um, yeah, interesting, I think, for us to discuss a little bit or certainly to um, sort of think about in, in terms of the settings where most of us work, I think, in places where um, engagement with customary structures is, is part of our day to day and sometimes part of the challenge as well in terms of how to think about these different uh, ways of uh, administering and managing land and access to HLP rights. So, um, so that's going to be followed by an update from Trezor on the information management work. Our shelter cluster colleagues are going to update on their HLP work and then we're going to hear from some of the uh, country operations, just brief updates uh, from Yemen, northeast Nigeria and South Sudan. And then there'll be any other business. So if you have things you want to share. Um, yeah, we have quite a lot. So we're going to keep it quite sort of um, punchy and, and keep it moving. Um, but at any point, if you want to ask uh, questions, please just either raise your hand right in the chat or, you know, if everyone's ignoring you, just, you know, shout out um, and we will manage that uh, appropriately. So don't worry about that. Um, OK, so firstly, just wanted to mention uh, a couple of things coming up. Uh, we have the World Urban Forum is taking place um, in in Cairo, and that's going to be in in November, the fourth to the fourteenth. Um, and that's an interesting event because not only does it focus on uh, 
all sorts of urban settings, as you would imagine. But it, but it really is a meeting point between, you know, the work we might do from a humanitarian perspective and those kind of longer term efforts to think about, you know, fit for purpose, sustainable land use and planning. Um, there's a sort of plans for a, an HLP related uh, training event um, called Laying the Groundwork for Durable Solutions. Um, and it might be that others on here are also involved in that event as well. Please feel free to write in the chat what you'll be doing there. Um, but that's in Cairo. I don't think there's an online option, but if there is, I'm going to um, make sure we share about that. The second thing to share where there definitely is an online option is the Global Protection Cluster Online Forum, which is going to be in November between the 4th and the 14th. Um, there's going to be like five or six online sessions of around 90 minutes. Um, the HLPAOR is going to be curating, managing, looking after a session on protection and solutions. Um, so if you, again, would be interested in maybe sharing some of your work or being part of that uh, from a kind of, you know, the production point of view, then please uh, let us know either through the chat or, or through email. Um, I'll just put our emails in the chat as well in case you um, yeah, need them. Um, and yeah, so that'll be happening in November. I think the HLP session will be on the 13th of November uh, and, and I will let you know uh, once that's confirmed. Um, but yeah, so that's uh, two things that are, are coming up. Um, Another thing I just wanted to mention as well for, for colleagues who are involved in um, the humanitarian programme cycle on the HNRPs at the moment, then please do let us know if um, if you require or would like some you know, technical support around the information management side, or if you would like to discuss anything that's happening, maybe some of the dynamics between you know, the clusters and, and OCHA and anything like that, if you need any support or want to discuss, then please do reach out and we'll be happy to arrange a call and, and look at how we can support you. Um, yeah, so that's by way of uh, kind of updates and uh, introductions from my side. Uh, please do, thank you, Joseph, putting the event there in the chat. Anyone who's got anything else they wanna share, please do. Um, and we'll also have a little chance at the end for um, you know, verbal or uh, interpretive dance uh, updates uh, via the, the meeting as well. Okay, so first then substantive point in our agenda is to invite colleagues from Afghanistan um, to, um, yeah, to, to give us their, their uh, presentation. Um, ben, I think I saw you on here earlier. Um, over to you, and I don't know if it's you alone or with colleagues or, or how it's working, but I trust you and give you the floor. Thanks very much, Jim. Yeah, um, yeah, I'll be giving the presentation. I think um, Irene uh, from the, uh, the the shelter cluster coordinator said she might be able to to join, but she has a another meeting. But if she can, she'll join. And if there are any questions about the shelter aspects, uh, she will, um, you know, uh, answer them. Um, OK, I'll just turn my camera off uh, and, and share my screen. OK, so um, OK, so today I'll present um, a program brief which has been developed by the HLP AOR and the shelter cluster in Afghanistan and you can see the uh, you can see it there uh, which details an integrated HLP and shelter response and returnee informal settlements and it focuses on the uh, Nangarhar province um, in Afghanistan so just for a bit of background um, so in 2023 uh, the government of Pakistan announced a policy of forced return of Afghan nationals uh, and since then uh, IOM, IOM has recorded uh, the return of, of over 600,000 uh, people at border points um, in the in the provinces of uh, Nangarhar and Kandahar, uh, both of which uh, share a border with uh, Pakistan. So currently, um, the humanitarian response uh, was focused on emergency assistance provided at border crossings. But given that the you know the vulnerability of this population, um, the modality of support uh, support uh, is shifting to um, to basically include a um, you know, OCHA led um, cross sectoral um, assistance in places of settlements. Uh, so, so the intention surveys uh, at the border show that 77% of these returnees uh, plan to return to their province of origin. And in this context, uh, Nangarhar province is one of the main areas of return. And within Nangarhar, uh, informal settlements um, are emerging as key sites. Uh, they're experiencing uh, high volumes of, of, of these returns from Pakistan. Um, 
So, yeah, so uh, returnees to these informal settlements, they face intersecting vulnerabilities and recent surveys carried out by, you know, HLP and other humanitarian partners uh, demonstrate, a, a, you know, a, a range of underlying needs. Uh, you know, there's the risk of eviction um, because they lack land, uh, secure land rights, they're, they're about inadequate shelters and other. And of course, they have uh, low incomes and it's women, both in female and male headed households that are particular, uh, particularly vulnerable. So I'll present the results of this uh, case study, which is a you know an HLP and shelter needs assessment and response plan that's um, you know targeted at informal settlements in uh, Nangarhar province. So what's the distribution of returnee settlements in, in informal settlements in in Nangarhar? So HLP assessment teams identified seven uh, major informal settlements located in and around the capital of of um, uh, of Nangarhar province, which is uh, Jalalabad municipality. And the sites range from zero to 25 kilometers, as you can see on this map uh, from Jalalabad city. Um, and, and since 2023, around 11,000 returnees from Pakistan um, have settled in these, these already established um, informal settlement sites. Uh, and they've located there because many, many actually come from there. They were low income migrants that, that, that resided in formal settlements um, prior to moving to Pakistan in search of economic opportunities and now returning to these communities. Uh, but um, also it's, it's likely that in the future when returnees go to other provinces, um, you know, they may they may not find uh, land and housing available and and they might come and relocate to uh, informal settlements close to uh, major cities like Jalalabad, uh, where they'll have access to livelihoods and also, you know, humanitarian services. So, um, you know, um, HLP partners have, uh, uh, you know, conducted a full household surveys of these uh, seven informal sites to assess their HLP and shelter needs. So residents of the seven sites, they face severe HLP needs. Um, they're subject to continuing and frequent threats of eviction by authorities. And the kind of HLP characteristics of these sites, uh, you know, they render these uh, residents highly vulnerable to the threats of eviction. Uh, most people occupied vacant land following um, displacement. Uh, some or, or others have, um, you know, um, uh, very weak occupancy claims uh, and uh, very few uh, as you can see on this graph, around between 66 and 70 percent have no documents at all to confer their their tenure status. There's not that much difference between um, uh, men and women headed households in this regard. Um, but as you can see, the, 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 the tenure and HLP status are very, very vulnerable. And also the quality of dwellings in the sites is very, very low. Most families dwellings are structures made of either mud brick, or mud paxa and more recent um, returns from Pakistan frequently live in, in tents, as you can uh, see a picture of, of one over there. Um, and, you know, m most of these uh, s s uh, dwellings are very uh, low capacity uh, uh, wash facilities. Uh, most just use a pit uh, pit or open latrine. Very, very few have any kind of flush latrine. And, and, and some also have, you know, more of the more recent uh, arrivals have uh, no um, you know, uh, latrine in their dwellings. So the HLP and Shelter Integrated Response Plan. So this, um, so to respond to these needs, I just outlined the HLP and Shelter AORs and also partners have developed uh, an integrated approach uh, to one, strengthen the community's HLP rights to reduce eviction uh, risks and provide a foundation for shelter investment, and two, to plan a, a, and implement shelter investments to improve the quality of life for um, for these uh, people. Um, and it does so through you know three main steps. The first is participatory land use mapping to strengthen HLP rights. Here, land use mapping is conducted to create a spatial record of the settlement, it includes approximate parcel boundaries, as you can see on that map. Uh, Community-based organisations endorse these maps, and they're also supported um, to secure the endorsement of the local authorities, which is very important. Um, and, and local authorities will you know, endorse and stamp uh, these maps, and this provides an important community-level uh, HLP uh, uh, document. Um, it also paves the way later for the household level, uh, you know, um, registration activities, for example, ICLA um, activities and other, um, you know, household and, and, and private ownership or occupancy based um, interventions. Uh, so the second step is this participatory assessment um, and, and um, spatial planning. Uh, and, and these spatial planning sessions identify critical shelter and infrastructure investments that are, that are needed to reduce vulnerabilities. Um, 
you know for the most vulnerable people um in those um, in those communities um and then communities are supported to get the you know authorities endorsement of these uh, settlement and and shelter investment plans and in this way you know the the shelter and and investment plan of the settlement obtains a level of official recognition which reduces the risk of eviction further and also mainstream shelter into the community and upgrading into the kind of community's future development. And then finally, the shelter investments are actioned, uh, you know, um, so the investments detailed in, 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 you know, in this participatory settlement plan are implemented, you know, and these are these upgrade shelter in coordination with local authorities to improve their living conditions and also, uh, you know, um, and also these are important kind of HLP interventions because uh, they consolidate the settlement, they strengthen the kind of relationship or bonds between the authorities and communities, uh, and in that way to increase what you know the the quote unquote de facto tenure security. That is not not just the legal tenure security, but the the actual tenure security of the informal settlement because it um, you know provides um, you know an official level of recognition that the authorities are supporting investment in these areas. Um, so that's you know that's very important. Uh, so. Just um, so way forward, what's going on now? So yeah, we're the integrated HLP and shelter projects. They're ongoing, uh, you know, in three informal settlements in Jalalabad uh, using the approach that was uh, just detailed. Uh, and this, you know, moving forward, I think this community centered HLP and shelter approach is going to be uh, complemented by ICLA and ICLA partners have received funding um, actually for uh, property rights verification and shelter uh, interventions in similar in similar areas in returning informal settlements. So the HLP um, and shelter, you know, uh, cluster and AORs are working to kind of coordinate these two program streams to, you know, um, secure tenure uh, at both the community and also at the um, household or, you know, um, pr private level. Uh, so yeah, and also the ESNFI and shelter cluster and HLP AOR, AOR are promoting this integrated approach as a best practice uh, to implement widely across the country. And as I mentioned, uh, we developed that brief, which is the you know the, the, this presentation is based on, and uh, hopefully uh, Jim will uh, be able to share that with you when um, when uh, you know um, in in the coming days. Um, so yeah, but crucially, of course, uh, for, for it to actually have a you know tangible impact on these you know hundreds of thousands of um, returnees, um, there's huge needs across the country. So it really needs to be scaled up, and so we'll be um, uh, you know looking for um, funding to. To, to address these issues and here you can see just a picture of a of an upgraded uh, shelter um okay so thanks very much i'll just leave it there um if anyone has any questions uh, please uh, let me know and i'll stop sharing my screen thank you ben thanks for that uh a great introduction to that work that's been ongoing and uh yes we'll certainly share the brief once it's ready to be shared um definitely happy to do that um yeah i want to open up to uh if anyone would has any comments reactions um or questions for ben or, or other there's a colleagues from uh, afghanistan or working in afghanistan who are here um please the floor is open we have a few minutes for this so please do go ahead Can even be a reaction to like have you seen uh work like this done in your context um with that kind of integrated approach is it something uh that you've yeah that is is unusual to you or or yeah how, how would it be amelia yeah over to you hi everyone this is amelia i'm the global lead for shelter and settlements at nrc um ben thanks so much for the presentation really interesting um, I'm quite intrigued um, to know, like, what you know, how challenging was it to to get some of the improvements in terms of HLP rights um, to therefore be able to to do the shelter upgrades using kind of more permanent materials and obviously establishing those homes in a much more kind of longer term way. Um, you know, what was what was some of the pushback and what was some of the ways that that was um, discussed and overcome? Thank you. Oh yeah, thanks very much. So um, yeah, so um, at the moment, so this, um, so basically, I think it's it's been challenging in general in Afghanistan to implement any kind of um, 
you know, uh, programs in uh, informal settlements, uh, particularly ones that, um, you know, um, focus on the, um, you know, uh, documenting of, of, of private um, land rights. Uh, there's many reasons for that. Uh, one of the reasons is because actually the government's not um, currently, you know, uh, issuing many land documents. So that's why at the moment we've used this community based approach. So we've, um, you know, we've basically, um, uh, you know, um, through a participatory process, uh, mapped all the land parcels, and then, as I explained, uh, got the um, you know endorsement of the local authorities. Um, so, on that basis, uh, in negotiating with the authorities, um, we've placed the settlement upgrading in terms of the household shelter investments in this kind of context of uh, uh, you know broader settlement upgrading. Um, so, despite some kind of initial uh, opposition um, from the authorities, uh, you know, they have been uh, supportive of um, investments of these kinds. Of course, they can't be they can't be um, implemented in all informal settlements and um, in some sites which are going to get evicted, you know, uh, you know, soon when there's very high threats of eviction, the authorities won't let any consolidation of um, of, of the sites to occur. So and um, I guess you're also talking about the verification of property rights prior to kind of individual household kind of shelter investments. So that would be um, Irene would hopefully uh, be here for that. That's part of the shelter component where they have a, a verification of uh, property rights prior to um, any transitional uh, shelter improvement. But um, I, I believe they have a robust process uh, for that to occur just to just to um, just to um, ensure that the person uh, who is receiving the upgrading services or the transitional shelter services, um, you know, is actually the owner um, and owner occupier. Um, um, so I, I hope that answers your question. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Thanks. Um, so uh, we have two more. So uh, Hamidullah and then Alexandra. Oh, he might have changed his mind. Uh, but Hamidullah, over to you. Uh, thank you so much. <clears throat> I'm so sorry. Uh, I cannot speak very well because I have a, a health problem today. But uh, I uh, wrote in the chat about the eviction problem in Kabul. Thank you. Thank you. Hope you feel better soon. Um, yes, so in the chat, he's highlighting that one of the key HLP issues is the eviction of informal settlements in Kabul. At the edge of the upcoming winter. So yes, that um, that's a, I know something that uh, Ben we've talked about before as well. That is one of the, yeah, underlying challenges I think that's going on as well as part of the the wider context. Thank you for for sharing that. Um, okay, so any uh, yeah, any final comments, thoughts on that one? Feel free to keep thinking as things come to you, or if you want to share something relevant from your context where you're working that is linked. Put it in the chat and, and we can we can come to it um, and there'll also be a little bit of time at the end hopefully to come back to anything if, if something strikes you whilst we're uh, uh, discussing now um, but thanks Ben thanks so much I look forward to reading the brief uh, in full and then sharing that uh, widely um, so yeah thanks so much um, okay so second substantive uh, item on the agenda is to welcome uh, Ombretta um, to um, yeah uh, share some of the upcoming work that's being done around working and engaging in customary settings. Um, Ombretta, I didn't see you earlier, so I'm sort of assuming you're here, but uh, I could be wrong. Uh, Eleonora's here. I saw Eleonora, yeah. definitely. Uh, hi, Jim. Hi, everyone. Uh, I actually uh, would like to send Ombretta's apologies. She's um, running late in another meeting, so perhaps we can try to move these items at the end of the agenda, if this is OK. It's totally fine by me and I'm sure fine by others as well. Um, thanks for letting us know. And yeah, let us know when she um, arrives and we can um, yeah just rework the agenda. So um, Trezor, you. I'll come to you now uh, to give us an update on some of the work you've been supporting around information management. Um, and uh, yeah, over to you. Yes, uh, thank you, Jim. 
I hope uh, you can see my screen. Yes, we see your screen and we hear you well. Thank you. So um, actually, uh, we are updating the, the Kubernetes dashboard. Uh, so the dashboard has has already been updated with uh, figures from 2024, and now uh, we are updating the dashboard with uh, 2024 uh, funding data. So uh, the data that uh, the information that the dashboard uh, display is uh, information on the people it meets, uh, so of HLP assistance. So it's the compilation uh, from different uh, HRP, from different uh, flash appeal, flash appeal, and also we have also uh, so the data also from uh, on on funding. Uh, we consider data from uh, the FTS, uh, the final the financial uh, tracking tracking system. So once the dashboard is update is updated, uh, we will include it in the in the website in the HLP website. Secondly, uh, on the HLP website, so the different uh, resources uh, we are trying to re reorganize them so that they can easily be accessible on the on the website. Um, in addition to that, also uh, as you know, uh, we we put in in, in place uh, a task team that were working on the development of the methodology to estimate uh, the people in need and severity for for HLP. So now um, we are closer to to the end. So actually, uh, what what we are doing now is to compile uh, different uh, materials that was uh, shared uh, within the task team and also now the now the initial step now it is, it is to draft uh, the pin and calculation uh, the pin and severity methodology for HLP and of course this will we will be done also with uh, input from all the task team uh, members so uh, we are not going to meet uh, until November because, as you know, actually the humanitarian uh, program cycle is ongoing, and we know that uh, most of uh, the task team members are busy in in this process. So we hope that uh, later in November we will uh, start the discussion, and this will be now to conclude uh, the work that have, uh, we we have been doing in developing the methodology. Of, uh, for to to estimate pain and severity for HLP. Uh, secondly, uh, this year we were able to provide in in country dedicated uh, um, support mission. So the, the, the first mission uh, took place in in DRC uh, on July, and the second one is uh, ongoing. Actually, I'm um, in Wakadu in Burkina Faso, supporting uh, the HLP AOR on information management aspect. So most of this support uh, focus more on the information management aspect, and these include, for example, the review of uh, existing data collection tools. Uh, we try also to put uh, in place uh, different uh, dashboard infographics that will allow uh, the coordination or the HLP uh, to increase uh, its visibility in the country, and also as the even the uh, program cycle process is on, ongoing. The support also includes uh, uh, yeah, the HPC also process as well. In, the, in addition to that also, uh, I have provided, we have, we have also provided uh, remote support. So first uh, to the Gaza HLP uh, technical working group, and this uh, was to create and update uh, the dedicated HLP technical working group uh, web page on response relief web. And also uh, this page also includes uh, a dashboard that allows uh, easy navigation to the legislative document uh, relevant to, to land administration in Gaza. So uh, here they, they had uh, they had a kind of uh, list of uh, different uh, documents and we created a dashboard that would allow them to go through these uh, different um, document and also uh, for Burkina Faso also they received as well uh, remote support in July and this support was uh, at the time they were, they were trying to put in place uh, the eviction dashboard 
yeah, that's all uh, from me. Uh, the support is still available. In case you need uh, information management support, just feel free to reach out to me uh, or Jim. Thank you. Thanks, Trezor, and thanks for joining us uh, from Burkina Faso to share that update. Um, yes, as Trezor mentions, uh, there's, you know, if you if you have particular questions or want some support around the information management side, even just to discuss things and, and try and understand what other people are doing as well, please let us know and we'd be really happy to, to set up a call. Um, Trezor mentioned the website, so that's something that there's been some, you know, all sorts of drama around the website in terms of changing hosting and all of this in the background with the global protection cluster um, but we're in the process now of that's i think settled and we're we're looking at how we reorganize and make sure the resources are better available and more easily accessible um, and giving it a full sort of overhaul in terms of how those hlp pages work and um, so i'm sure i'll be coming to uh, some of you if not all of you uh, to get your uh, thoughts and inputs in terms of things that we might be missing and one thing i would say is we'll be doing a sort of shout out a call out for relevant HLP related uh, documents, publications that are available publicly uh, that we could include on there to make it a really sort of uh, vibrant sort of resource bank. Um, so again, if there are things that you know you like rely on or, or that you think are worth sharing and that people could benefit from uh, from different contexts, then it'd be great to to understand them more. We'll, we'll look to uh, set up a process by which we kind of seek those from you. But if you had any ideas or want to share those ahead, please either email, put in the chat, get in contact, however. Um, but that's something that will be coming in the in the next um, few months. So thank you, uh, Trezor, um, and thank you for the update. Um, yeah, if there are any of you in operations where there's not currently a relief web page for your uh, HLP working group or AOR or, or whatever else it might be called, um, again, we can uh, support with setting that up. So please let us know. It's quite an easy way then for you to be able to gather your country's resources into one place and to uh, make that available as well. So, yeah, that's just a, a sort of a, an offer, an ongoing offer to, to you there. Um, thanks. OK, so next we will turn to um, our colleagues from the Global Shelter Cluster working on uh, HLP. Um, Ibire, I think you are going to um, yeah, give an update from your side, although I have seen also Melina on here and maybe also Stephanie as well. So Ibire, I think over to you. Um, others join in as you will. Thanks, Jim. Ah, oh, yeah, good. Yes, a uh, quick one. Quick one from the Global Shelter Cluster uh, uh, updates. We've um, we've uh, started the, the producing the a new module for the HOP uh, online training. Um, the HOP online training, which is open, anyone can use, doesn't require any registration. Uh, currently, it has five modules. And uh, we are in the process of producing a sixth module. The sixth module will be focused on urban settlements and HLP. And uh, we started producing that. Uh, we, we have a film crew that last week was in Colombia in filming in informal settlements to capture interviews with uh, displaced persons there and the challenges that they face. And those uh, interviews and images and stories will be featured in this uh, new module. So uh with that uh that footage uh we should be able to produce this this last module by the end of next month uh i'm going to post the link in the chat here to the existing modules um we have already we have also a uh, we had a, a mission to afghanistan uh, where we met with the um, uh, shelter cluster partners in Nangahar province uh, to listen to their uh, needs and gaps and where they need support and started to outline a strategy for, for supporting the shelter cluster partners over there on uh, the HRP challenges that they face. Had a meeting with Ben Flower as well uh, last week to catch up on that. And lastly, uh, also in Colombia, we have an agenda with the local, uh, the National Shelter Cluster there as well on a mission to assess uh, needs and uh, plan uh, further support 
to the country. And uh, that's the update. Nibiru, thank you for that. Um, and for, yeah, uh, making the, the link with uh, Afghanistan as well uh, from the shelter side. Um, yeah, thank you. And um, yes, I, I put a link already to those training modules um, in, the, in the chat. Uh, the current ones uh thank you for those um and yeah good timing as well with the world urban forum coming up it's um yeah interesting to be focusing on that at the same time um good to see look forward to seeing that and sharing it it widely um i just thought um ben if you're still online there was a question relating to afghanistan that came in uh from our colleague uh metab who i believe is works in bangladesh um, but it's looking at um, asking about Afghanistan. Um, have you encountered cases where returnees present their previous land documents and express a desire to return to a specific piece of land that belonged to their family or ancestors? Wondering, uh, so interested to know the challenges in handling such cases. Um, yeah, so I don't know, Ben, if you're there or, or other colleagues in Afghanistan who want to take that one on. Oh yeah, no. I'll just yeah. I'll, I'll, I can mention that. Yeah. So, um, I think yeah. That's a very. It's actually going to be. I think it's going to be a key issue. So when we're doing the HNRP uh, for 2025, it's um because right now there are people returning to their province of origin, and in fact, if you look at the, for example, a Thai mentioned before the informal settlement um, eviction threats in in Kabul. So actually, the the authorities are trying to remove. Um, people from Kabul and, uh, you know, return them to their province of origin because these are kind of IDP and formal settlements. And in those sites, so in areas where there was a lot of conflict, say, for example, today we were talking to the focal point from uh, Kunduz, uh, which is in the northeast of Afghanistan and was an area with a lot of conflict. And now that there's, you know, peace in the area, um, people from these informal settlements, either by choice voluntarily or, or because they're being evicted, they're returning to their uh, province of origin. And then, uh, yeah, then there, you're having a lot of issues now, um, you know, with with uh, issues of a secondary occupation where, um, you know, where people are going and they're with land documents or with claims of ownership to areas um, or land in areas, um, you know, that, that have recently become accessible again. And there you're having uh, a lot of land conflicts. So, I mean, there, I think ICLA, is going to be, uh, you know, an indispensable um, programmatic approach, and um, you know, to um, to kind of resolve some of these land conflicts. And if it's of interest, um, before when I was working in Sri Lanka, we had exactly the same issue with hundreds of thousands of people return returned to the northern province. And I'm happy to share a paper that we did about a, a you know, a fit for purpose um, land administration approach uh, where, uh, you know. Um, People are, you know, kind of settled in areas that have, have recently been, um, you know, uh, made safe again following the war and kind of approaches that enable that to happen, um, you know, using intermediary tenure documents and other approaches um, that are kind of uh, that are better, that, that, that are kind of responsive to that fluid uh, situation. Because as you mentioned, it's, it's a very difficult situation. And, and you know, um, there's a lot of approaches to, and I'm sure Jim would know quite a lot about it with, you know, dispute resolution mechanisms and other things that focus specifically on, you know, land conflicts to do with kind of secondary occupation and things like that. So, um, yeah, um, there's, so there's no, there's, there's no concrete examples yet that we've published or information documents, that, uh, knowledge documents that we've got from Afghanistan on that issue. But it's definitely an emerging issue that will, um, you know, that will have to be addressed in the coming uh, months and years. Thanks, Ben, and thanks for the question. And if, if other colleagues have um, examples from where they're working about people uh, returning and, um, yeah, with, with land documents that um, uh, and how they've responded to that, that question around, you know, the potential for secondary, you know, for wanting to return and have finding their land or house occupied or destroyed. I know it comes up in a lot of contexts. So, again, if there are good practices uh, that you want to share, we'll look to, um, yeah, maybe we can uh, put something together as well uh, from, from what we have around on the, the AOR resources pages. Uh, but, yeah, thanks for the question and thanks for the response. Uh, ben, um, 
Good. So we're going to move now to hear from uh, some colleagues um, about sort of operational updates from when you're where you're working. Uh, so we have colleagues from Yemen, South Sudan, and Northeast Nigeria who would said they wanted to share an update. If others of you would like to share something afterwards, just from where you are, it can be very informal. Just a few words on something that's happening or, or something that's going on. Uh, please, then you're very welcome. Uh, have a have a think for a moment um, and we'll come to you, you later. Um, first, I want to turn to colleagues from Yemen. Uh, Saha, um, uh, over to you. Thank you very much, Jim. Can you confirm that you can hear me? Yes, hear you well. OK, great. Thank you very much. First, I would like to say um, hello to everyone. My name is Sahara Najjar. I'm the ICLA Yemeni specialist and part of my role, I co-lead the HLP working group alongside with my colleagues from UNHCR and UN Habitat. And it's a pleasure to meet you all today and to be able to provide an update from Yemen in a such a global um, meeting. Uh, our update today will be focusing on one of the uh, recent um, initiatives by the HLP working group in Yemen, where we have produced the first eviction uh, dashboard uh, focusing on Marib. Jim, can you help me to share the presentation? Just one moment, yeah. Okay. So while Jim is um, uh, sharing the presentation, allow me to 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 give you some question, which will will be answering it during this presentation. So today I will be focusing on the um, eviction dashboard, which focusing on Marib. Why we have selected um, Marib? Why we were in need? Uh, we we were in need for this dashboard. How we have developed it, and how we will be using it. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so we have selected Marib because Marib, one of the governorate that is hosting the largest number of IDPs in Yemen. Around 1,006,000 um, um, IDPs are in uh, Marib. Um, and out of this, around 385 are in an IDP site, which means that the remaining number of IDPs are in a rented uh, accommodation. Um, May, maybe you know that Yemen have been for a long time in a prolonged, protracted um, conflict started on March 2015. And at that time, before the conflict, the population of Marib was around 300 something. And currently, uh, Marib is 2 million boy and uh, something out of this 2 million, 1 million point six are from the IDP. So, uh, you, you can see the, the increment in the number of population due to the IDPs uh, within Marib. So, through the dashboard that you can see in the screen, you can see around 2.2 sites across Marib. Out of this uh, 2.2, there are 36 sites uh, are facing an uh, eviction threat that is that is impacting around uh, 41 IDPs. Also, from the um, 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 the dashboard, we can see that around 80. 8.61 of these sites are in a private land and majority of the um, sites are either in oral or there is no um, um, a written agreement. And when we speak about eviction, we could understand that one of the uh, main ev eviction um, threats or uh, the main reason of eviction threat is not having an occupancy agreement or a legal document that legalize the process of um, the residency of those IDBs on this um, Land. Also, through the uh, uh, dashboard, you can see that, as mentioned, that around 41,000 um, um, are affected by this um, eviction threat. And this is only about those who are settled within IDB sites, while the biggest number are in the rented accommodation, which is unfortunately we're not having an, an accurate data to be reflected in the dashboard, and it's going to be one of the main um, uh, things to be reflected in the upcoming uh, dashboards. Um, uh, why we have developed this uh, dashboard? Due to all, due to this huge number of IDPs, there was a huge need for having a tool that could help us to monitor and do analysis for the eviction risk, so we could address this kind of uh, HLP needs and support um, our uh, coordination efforts. Also, to inform our advocacy effort. Um, and um, um, organize our resources to support to this uh, huge need. During the past uh, period, uh, we were able. Uh, this uh, this uh, dashboard was um, um, 
produced last month. And through this data, we're able to attend some of the donor meeting and inform our um, our advocacy key messages. It looked like I finished my five minutes, but I can go very fast to the second slide. Okay, the fine, second slide fine. is... You're fine, carry okay. on, Sarah, carry on. Okay, thank you very much. So the second slide is include a general update about the HLP Working Group. So the HLP Working Group mainly started in Yemen in 2021, but it was mainly about NRC, UN Habitat and UNHCR. But due to the a huge need in Yemen for HLP and HLP needs, there was a, a huge need for reworking on reviewing our TOR as HLP Working Group. So we, feel we have worked on at reviewing the TOR to include a membership and include more members to support us to um, together address this um, HLP needs and have a systematic uh, response mechanism through the HLP working group. So the HLP working group was reactivated in um, in July 2024. The first meeting and the second meeting was uh, conducted the past two months and we were able through the second meeting to start producing our eviction dashboard as one of the initiative, having um, a harmonized HLB uh, capacity building package and starting to uh, extend the support for some of the cluster like the shelter cluster and the mine action cluster. Thank you and over to you. Thank you, Sahir. Thank you for that update. Um, does anyone have any uh, questions or, or comments uh, on on either the uh, eviction uh, threat dashboard or on the update from the uh, working group? It's interesting to see on the dashboard how you're capturing the type of agreement as well. Um, I think that's um, yeah, really interesting. And I wonder if I had a quick question around, you know, you've categorised them as sort of oral or written. Are there like varying different types within those those broad categories, uh, particularly on the oral side? I'd be interested to hear what are those agreements like? OK, so while this dashboard gem was um, uh, providing only information about Marib, so Marib, one of the most complex tribal system in Yemen, where manhood is stronger than the um, written agreement for them, and most of the land is owned by the private, um, by the tribals. Even those uh, governmental building, it's settled in some of the tribal um, lands. So when it comes to IDB sites, they are willing to give you the land, but they feel that a written agreement is something that they don't have to write it because they commit to their words. So in Marib, most of the um, um, the lands agreements is uh, an oral agreement. While we are, we started to do a lot of advocacy to start having some um, um, a written agreement. So during all the past year, we're having only one agreement. Currently, we have three through the effort of this year, and we are working closely uh, with the authorities there to have more written agreements. This is an interesting one on the type of agreement, because I know in some contexts, you know, having a written agreement is really helpful. And in other contexts, a, a written re agreement can be resisted or be less helpful as well, uh, depending on what's going on. So it's uh, yeah, an interesting you know, thing. Sometimes the assumption is that, you know, a written one might be better or, or more useful, but but it has to have that kind of community owned and based oral setting as well. So, yeah, thanks for that. Um, Alex, yeah, please. Following up on that uh, thought is for for a place where the oral agreement is so highly valued because it is sort of rooted in people's sense of honor. I'm wondering if there could be an advocacy rather than move them to written, which they might not trust because a lot of people have sort of high rates of illiteracy. But if there's other ways of recording those agreements, just so that there is sort of some way to refer back to it. So whether people can use their phones to to take a video or to, to just take an audio recording and whether that would be a sufficient way to to at least preserve that information. Um, is that something that you have tried or explored? Um, and if so, what kind of feedback have you gotten over? Thank you very much, Alexander. Actually, having the video, it's um, it's even worse than the written, but we have thought about something at, uh, a bit out of the box. I'm trying 
um, within the upcoming time to have a forum that is makes uh, like bringing all the people to the table and to have um, a, like a land dispute committee forums, including all the um, um, community leaders, tribal system leaders, and the uh, government authority responsible about IDP sites and the HLP working group. Through this system, we'll be having a list of these sites that is owned by some of those leaders who are part of the forums and then to sign on a list that this was uh, agreed by them. So to have something that is, they feel they have the ownership, not ownership of the land, ownership of the initiative itself, and then to sign on the document. It's like to have a written document in, in, a, in a will agreed way by them. But having a video, it's like, you don't trust me, that's why you're recording me. But then we try to think out of the box, how we let them on the process, contribute to the solution, which also will fit the um, the uh, effort for the durable solution. Thank you and over to you. Thank you. Thanks for the question and thanks for your response, Sahe. Um, great. Um, again, you know, if other questions or comments come up, please put them in, in the chat. In the meantime, I'll turn to colleagues in uh, uh, South Sudan, I think. Is that the right order? Oh, uh, Northeast Nigeria, I was going to go to. Um, uh, Jasini, are you on the call? And if so, over to you. Maybe not. OK, so I will come to colleagues in South Sudan. I think, Margaret, um, I think you were going to give an update on some of the things you've been working on in South Sudan. Uh, Margaret, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Jim, for the opportunity. Um, hello, HLP colleagues. My name is Margaret Wasuk, the HLP AOR uh, coordinator for South Sudan. South Sudan's leadership is um, at uh, we have NRC as the as the lead agency and uh, IOM and uh, national NGO called HDC as co-leads. And uh, we just wanted to uh, let our HLP colleagues know that here in South Sudan, we recently um, launched, validated and launched our housing, land and property uh, publications, which include uh, a HLP documentary, a 10 minute documentary giving people um, just the context of South Sudan and the various HLP issues that are uh, faced here in South Sudan. Then uh, the second publication is the Land Tenure Guidelines. This is a document that will guide most of the HLP partners on how to go about handling HLP matters here in South Sudan. We ended up having 11 11 guidelines and just to mention them quickly, uh, the first one was to ensure and conduct a comprehensive analysis of legal and regulatory uh, frameworks for HLP. South Sudan still uh, does not have uh, any legal frameworks that are guiding in terms of getting or solving some, most of the HLP issues. So we are doing a comprehensive analysis to ensure that the HLP partners understand what laws uh, are in place and how they can be able to advise beneficiaries or clients accordingly. Then uh, the second one is also conducting due diligence to verify HLP uh, ownership because there's most times we find there's a double allocation of uh, land documents. So what we have put in this uh, guideline is just the best ways to carry out due diligence when having um, HLP interventions. Then uh, the third one is to leverage uh, legal protection to safeguard HLP rights. That is to ensure that um, protection of, 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 of the rights of people are upheld when we are responding to that. Then another one is also planned for adjudication of HLP disputes. These HLP disputes um, are, are through um, collaborative dispute resolution mechanisms that help in peaceful coexistence in the community. So this is also something that is being rolled out for people, especially the partners, to understand how best to advise um, matters of HLP. Uh, we also have uh, 
facilitation uh, of access to legal identity in South Sudan, we have to have the nationality certificate and the nationality ID to be able to, you know, uh, get some of these, for example, land documents or any uh, court issues or court uh, representation, you need legal identity. So we are also uh, giving um, the HLP partners this tool to be able to understand how best to advise. Um, also, we, we also have the pilot of good practices to promote tenure security, as well as um, implement and monitor land tenure security indicators, and also design and implement HLP programs, uh, apply resilience uh, lens for HLP programming, and then also address linkages between uh, gender-based violence and access to HLP, because in South Sudan you find majority of the gender-based violence issues come up because of matters related to HLP, so that is also really um, being pushed. And then foster, lastly, is foster cross-sectional and interagency collaboration, because we are trying to ensure that HLP works hand in hand with other uh, areas of responsibility and also other clusters to ensure that HLP issues are addressed efficiently. So that is just the 11 um, principles or the land tenure guidelines that we have we have uh, come out with then we also came out with two documents that is our HLP AOR uh, strategy with the uh, um, vision is every individual should enjoy a secure HLP rights and the mission being to improve humanitarian responses for prevention and resolution of HLP violations so for the strategic objectives, we also have um, some strategic objectives. I'll just put them in point form for the our 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 strategy. The first one is to strengthen collaboration and coordination uh, for effective HLP initiatives. Then the second one is to facilitate joint advocacy and policy influence, because uh, you know as we now in HLP we are not being given all the attention. We are trying to make sure that the attention is there on why HLP is important. The third one is to strengthen capacity and promote um, inclusive HLP prevention. Then lastly is to support resource mobilization uh, um, across the humanitarian, developmental, and peace uh, partners. So that is just a uh, our strategies look is, is going to is actually looking like and uh, we also have an advocacy uh, strategic objectives because we have an advocacy strategy and we only have three strategic objectives for the advocacy one is to shift power towards locally led responses in south sudan we are being pushed to localization so we really want to empower the local partners to be able to intervene in terms of HLP rights, then equally to increase investment in HLP. There's not so much investments put in uh, housing, land and property. So we are also pushing for that. And lastly is um, HLP is central to humanitarian and developmental responses. So this is just a brief update on what we are doing. Right now, uh, we actually launched all these pub uh, publications on the 18th, which is last Wednesday on at country level. And we will share uh, all this once they're ready, since they are being graphically designed so that we can share them widely with all, all the colleagues, uh, hopefully by the beginning of next month. So this is what uh, HLP AOR South Sudan has. Um, yeah, over to you, Jim, thank you. Thank you, Margaret, for that update. And yes, lots of uh, exciting things um, being developed and, and, and launched uh, in South Sudan. So we'll be sharing those once they're ready. Uh, but yeah, thanks for the update. Um, any comments, questions, please uh, feel free to raise hands or write in the chat, um, either now or in the coming minutes. Um, otherwise, I'll turn now to uh, Jasini, who joins us uh, from northeast Nigeria. Um, let's uh, give a short update on uh, what's happening uh, there. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, just to give you a few uh, 
of what is going on in Notice Nine there at the moment. Uh, let me just try to share my screen. I don't know if you can see. Yes, we see the yeah the PowerPoint. It's kind of still in the PowerPoint. Um, it's, yes. Yeah, there we go. That's it. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, on the tenth uh, day of September, twenty twenty four, there was a flooding that occurred in. Uh, Maiduguri uh, Metropolitan Council, as well as Jerry uh, local government area of Borno State, one of the key areas we are working with in Northeast Nigeria, where I'm based uh, because I'm based in Maiduguri. Uh, it follows uh, a flooding that occurred from the breakdown of uh, one of the dams known as Alo Dam uh, in Maiduguri, which led uh, to affecting uh, almost 40 percent of the town uh, with approximately about 400,000 people uh, having to move into relocation site. Uh, at, at the time of this report, uh, we had about 503,000 persons affected by this flooding. And then uh, access issues also was uh, recorded because uh, major bridges that were linking the town were broken down as a result of the flooding. And then uh, we had about 7,000 houses that were completely damaged and many others partially uh, destroyed as well as damaged. And then uh, over half of the relocation site were uh, schools that uh, were supposed to be on academic session, but uh, were forced to close down because of the emergency. And uh, as at the time of the report, we still had ongoing registration at this site, which were already overcrowded and uh, had high cases of uh, congestion and also uh, cases of open defecation. And then the flood also damaged uh, thousands of hectares of farmland. Uh, and this is coming at a time of uh, almost harvest uh, with the challenge of uh, uh, the high uh, inflation as well as the with scarcity that is being faced in uh, Northeast Nigeria. And also uh, some of the houses, even though are not destroyed, are now uh, being affected in terms of the structure and is now unsafe for people to live uh, in. And will require some form of uh, quality assessment before people move into those houses. Uh, in terms of the current response we're doing as an AOR, uh, we supporting people uh, outside the camps with uh, kind of uh, cash incentive in the form of post eviction cash assistance to be able to secure alternative temporary accommodation until uh, the water completely rescind and people can go back to their houses. And then uh, we're also carrying out assessment uh, to assess the level of uh, damages uh, to HLB access uh, that have uh, already occurred. Uh, we're doing this assessment together with the government uh, agency as well as other sectors. So it's going to be a multi-sectoral need assessment in which uh, the finding will be shared uh, with all. And then uh, we're also working on facilitating the recovery of documentation uh, that have been destroyed or lost during this uh, loading. And this uh, our main focus for now is HLP documentation as HLP AOR, but we are also working together with ECLA colleagues to also support people that have lost uh, legal as well as civil documentation. And also we are uh, providing free legal advice and counseling on HLP, guiding individuals through the complex legal procedure on how to recover some of this property document. Uh, we're also providing some kind of uh, mobile resources to aid uh, affected household in rebuilding their homes uh, together with uh, shelter partners and, and CCCM partners as well. And uh, lastly, we're co collaborating with uh, the food security sector to also uh, support uh, affected farmers uh, in order for them to reclaim as well as rehabilitate damaged farmlands and ensure our livelihood are restored. Uh, for the major challenge for now that we have in terms of uh, the response is uh, the access restriction. Uh, although for now, uh, the water have rescinded uh, to a very significant amount, but unfortunately the water is now moving towards other LGAs and is causing more havoc. As at uh, today, uh, places like Dikwa, which are uh, under operations and then Gala, 
uh, suffering this uh, flooding and uh, access is completely uh, shut down and the town is completely submerged into water. Uh, people have been completely displaced in those locations. An assessment is yet to be carried out in those locations. Uh, like I men mentioned, overcrowded in uh, the temporary location site is also another challenge. Uh, there are limited spaces to, uh, to settle these people. Uh, but uh, uh, with uh, the water receding, uh, we're hopeful that uh, this uh, challenge will be overcome as people gradually uh, begin to return uh, to their place of uh, abode. And then uh, the challenge of uh, the damages that have been done by this flood to houses, which has made them unsafe and also uh, inhabitable. Uh, and it's also uh, going to complicate uh, repair and reconstruction effort because some of these houses need to be properly assessed and check whether it's fit for habitation before people move in. Because so far we've recorded two incidents whereby uh, upon the return, uh, the houses themselves collapse uh, on the resident and uh, we didn't want such kind of incidents to occur uh, again. And so uh, we're discussing with the government agencies so as to try to do a kind of integrated test to uh, some of the structures before people move into them. And then another issue that has resurfaced is the issue of uh, landlord and tenant uh, disputing over whose responsibility to repair uh, the damaged houses. Uh, although uh, uh, impliedly uh, under our law, uh, it's the landlord responsibility for such structural uh, damages, but uh, this is an occurrence that is beyond uh, uh, human understanding. And so uh, it's not uh, a usual occurrence. And so it has created a kind of dispute between uh, some tenant and landlord as to who is supposed to repair this uh, damage structures between them, even though uh, we're also advocating to the government for support, which the government is also committed uh, based on uh, the awards to support in rebuilding these houses. And we hope that will also go a long way in uh, resolving some of the concerns. But uh, we still have a couple of cases whereby uh, there's dispute between the landlord and uh, the tenant on the repairs. And then lastly, uh, the challenge of limited available resources and funding to uh, address this uh, widespread uh, damage, uh, which is also uh, worsened by the inflation and the economic instability we are currently facing. Uh, part of the challenge with the funding is that uh, the pool fund that was supposed to provide some kind of emergency funding uh, uh, for us, uh, we were not prioritized as HLP. And this has been one of the challenge uh, we've been facing uh, for quite some time. I think uh, throughout my tenure, only once have we received funding uh, as an AOR from uh, NHF. And uh, the, the, the language has always been uh, we not uh, providing life saving uh, assistance, even after several uh, argument on that with uh, NHF. Uh, like for this year, we had about three different reserve allocation, but none was uh, allocated to uh, HLP. And uh, we continue to participate in a dispatchery plan as well as uh, uh, the flood response plan, but uh, when it comes to uh, priority, uh, we are always left out. I don't know if uh, this is also something that uh, from the global level uh, we may need to add our voices to, uh, particularly in terms of how these funding are located. Uh, so these are uh, our major concerns for now. And uh, sorry, I. Don't know if uh, I've taken more than the five minutes, and uh, I think uh, I will just stop here. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, over to you, Jim, uh, colleagues, for comment. Uh, Thanks so much. Thank you so much for for sharing that update, and um, yeah, of of the current situation and extra challenges going on with the the flooding, adding already to what was a a very challenging context. But thank you for for that update. Um, yeah, colleagues, if any of you would like to comment or re respond, um, I think the question around uh, funding and resources and prioritisation is one that probably everybody on this call um, can relate to. Um, it's something that comes up often um, around how our 
we um, how are HLP issues seen? Where are they uh, considered as a priority or, or not? Um, you know, one of the the things that we spend quite a lot of time doing from the global side, as well as I know you do as well, is advocating for um, seeing how HLP issues are important for um, any kind of response to be effective and have a, a an, an impact. And uh, particularly when we're looking at the longer term uh, outcomes, but also in the immediate uh, moment as well. So I think that's, yeah, you're not alone, but that doesn't answer the challenge or make it any easier. Um, as we start to try and push on that, we'll make sure we keep communicating uh, what we're saying, how we're saying it. Um, but I think that is an area we're all looking at and, and thinking about. And I know it's on our on our sort of radar to um, think more systematically about how we create good advocacy products for, for you to be able to use and, and draw on. Um, you know, for example, I, I had a, a request from uh, one operation around, uh, you know, designing and developing a, a sort of a one pager on on sort of key HLP issues, why they matter, but written in an accessible and uh, understandable way for those who aren't necessarily HLP technicians. And of course, that's one of those things that is easy to say and quite hard to do. Um, but I think it's a challenge that we all need to be thinking about. How do we share about our work in a way that those that aren't specialists or, you know, HLP geeks um, can find uh, understandable and, and understand why it matters to them? So, yeah, thanks for, for raising that. Um, open to others to respond to that particular question or if you have any updates you would like to give. Um, we have a few minutes now to um, yeah, for, if anyone would like to share something they're working on, an update, um, maybe a, a recent publication or um, an event or whatever, um, you are welcome to. Laura, yes, over to you. Yes, thank you, Jim. Good afternoon, colleagues. Um, a quick update from Uganda and from a refugee hosting country, but um, so dealing with a lot of HLP issue. Uh, we recently launched uh, two reports. Uh, one that looks at um, the settlement. Uganda does not have camp, refugee camp, but we have a settlement system, uh, which is like a village system. And we have uh, done extensive work on housing, land and property in the settlement. And uh, we had a reflection exercise on some of our best practice and lessons learned um, in some of these settlements that are uh, located in privately owned land. Um, and have been present for 15, in some cases, even 20 years. So we are in a protracted crisis uh, where um, some of these landlords gave their land for the first, first of establishing the settlement, thinking the refugee were going to be in Uganda for five years. And here we are 20 years later, we still have the refugee. So quite a lot of reflection on uh, how to use um, due diligence, but also how to continue to advocate for uh, security of tenure uh, in some of these locations. I will share the link. And then the other one is um, working with our uh, livelihood colleagues uh, for uh, block farming and um, trying to uh, secure land for block farming. And we had some very positive uh, experience in uh, some of these settlements where we were able to secure uh, land uh, around 800 acres in other location, even more for three years, five years, so a long-term uh, plan and um, for free without any payment of rent. And now uh, our livelihood team is uh, working with different refugee groups and host community groups uh, to subdivide this land uh, into blocks. And, and, and we are already into one year of this process and farming uh, this land. And that has been also very positive um, in terms of ensuring and the refugee can farm, don't pay rent, but uh, that there is also NRC really in between uh, the various landowner and the refugee group. So uh, I'll put that link as well. And i um, very happy to uh, hear if there is any question or comments. Thank you, Jim. Thanks so much, Laura. Thank you for, for sharing that. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks for that update. Um, Yes, open to comments, questions, uh, responses. Um, Adriana, uh, turn to you. Um, I was just going to comment that I noticed there's quite a few of our shelter cluster colleagues on the call, and um, yeah, which is great to see and wanted to really welcome you and say thanks for, for being here. But yes, over to you, Adriana, please. 
Thank you. No, my my intervention is just want to share some activities that we are doing here in Sudan. It's more related to that, but it's not a question for for Laura. Is want to share. Is just wanted to share the um, that yesterday during our shelter cluster meeting we did the kit of of the presentation of the cash specialist who is coming to help us to develop a comprehensive guidance for cash for shelter and rental support. So we just start in this process and then we hope to have the guidance or the first draft to be done at the end of this year. So just this update for from our side. Thank you. Thanks so much and thanks for, for sharing that update uh, from Sudan. Um, on Sudan, um, we're in the process of uh, supporting the HLP uh, working group to become more engaged and active and uh, uh, hopefully becoming an AOR soon. And uh, yeah, but look forward to hearing how that guidance develops and uh, uh, sharing that widely once it's uh, available. But yeah, thanks so much, Adriana. Um, yes, any questions, comments on that, please uh, do come in. Uh, otherwise, I will turn. Oh, Barbara, you have your hand up now. This could be a question or an update or both, but I'll, over to you and you can uh, use the space mm -hmm. however you wish. <laughs> yeah, it, it's just it was a question to Laura. I put it in the, in the chat also. Um, yes, I mean, maybe the answer can be just read the report, Barbara. But yeah, how did you convince the, uh, the owners to, uh, you know, give for free for you know three five years i can't remember exactly what you said i mean what's the interest do they get part of the harvest is there yeah that's the question morris <laughs> yes thank you barbara it was a lot of negotiation um definitely because no rent is being paid um there was just two main turning point i would say in the negotiation table the first one was that the Office of the Prime Minister, which is the Uganda agency that is in charge of managing this uh, settlement and, and refugee uh, issue in Uganda, um, helped us uh, in the negotiation process and was really quite uh, an advocate in ensuring that the land is advocated for free. Some of this land was not being used and it's very mm -hmm. far. Uh, so there was really um, no much interest in terms of renting to private sector and, and making a profit. And then um, landlord received a token of appreciation from uh, from the government, and also they are recognized by the government as supporting uh, the peaceful coexistence uh, with the refugee. And then uh, the project benefited uh, also for uh, host community. So um, if you look at the report, there's a breakdown in terms of how many beneficiary currently are coming from the refugee community and how many from the host community and for the host community uh, our livelihood team uh, helped them uh, with seeds and tools for planning um, and, um, and farming in their land and also there's a lot of activities including uh, ensuring that they access uh, uh, farmers markets and other activities that have started now that are really beneficial for uh, the host community. So some of these landowners are also benefiting because they are also farming uh, some of their own land and now are part of this more, uh, you know, uh, larger block farming effort uh, in the settlement. Thank you. Great, thanks a lot, Laura. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Great question and uh, interesting. Uh, yeah, to to hear about that. Um, yes. Any other uh, colleagues would like to share a, an update or a thought, a wise word, um, anything that you would like to to share with the group? Um, no pressure to, but if you do have something you'd like to share, we're always eager to hear. Um, I will just carry on with a couple of other things I wanted to say, but feel free to raise your hand if you want to come in. Um, yeah, just to say, I we will hear next time from Ombretta. Unfortunately, she's been held up in a, a meeting that she can't um, uh, get out of. Um, so uh, she will join us next time to give the update and share about the work that's being done uh, by UN Habitat looking at working in customary settings. Um, I believe the report might even be out by then, so um, we can sort of combine it with being able to actually share the thing that she's talking about. Uh, um, yeah, that should be uh, an interesting thing, and we'll make sure we have plenty of time to um, discuss around some of those issues, because I think, you know, even as we've discussed today a little bit about um, yeah, formal kind of written uh, agreements versus oral agreements and, and the different types of those and where they can have 
uh, greater significance or actually create challenges. You know, there's that, those tensions around the different ways we understand and approach uh, HLP rights and, and recognising those. So that will be something we can get into a little bit next time. So really look forward to that. But yes, so she sent her apologies and uh, uh, we'll, we'll look at that next time. Um, I just wanted to mention that um, I joined the Global Protection Cluster Coordinator and the other Area of Responsibility Coordinators on a mission to Ethiopia. Um, we were there at the beginning of uh, September. Um, and got a chance to spend a um, few days in, in Addis, where we met with um, the HCT, the humanitarian country team, and uh, the protection cluster and partners, as well as the intercluster coordination group and, and other partners as well. And we also spent um, some time up in Shire, um, in Tigray, um, and again, like seeing the impact of the uh, well, of, of the conflict there, but also uh, a real kind of challenge in terms of resources where it's being sort of labelled as a, you know, post-conflict area. But in reality, there are very real needs and people are kind of stuck wanting to return home. But lots of cases where there's secondary occupation and, uh, you know, real violence being meted out to those that are trying to return uh, in a context where uh, those returns are being encouraged, even if the, the people themselves might want to, but aren't always sure if it's safe to do so. So there's some real kind of challenges there in terms of this 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 moment between the kind of the, the emergency humanitarian response and the longer term solutions thinking. And something we were trying to do was look at how we can support and encourage better connections there. But I'll give a more fuller update next time. I'd, I'd plan to do it next time uh, because of the uh, the timings, but I um, just had a few moments to say. Yeah. Um, but yes, we're going to be keep working with our colleagues in Ethiopia to support um, what's happening there on HLP and coordination and, and how we can um, make sure uh, we we improve and, and, and increasingly meet the needs if, if we can. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, um, I don't know if I've got colleagues here from uh, Interaction, uh, but just say we, you know, I was able to join the Interaction task team on HLP last week and um, there's all sorts of exciting things uh, in the pipeline there around sort of advocacy briefs on um, on HLP. Julie, I see you. You're very welcome to say something yourself, but you don't have to. I don't want to put you on the spot, um, but I thought I would mention it um, in case you wanted to share. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Um, I think to one of the points made previously, um, as Jim said, we're working on an advocacy brief um, that will be on HLP due diligence targeted at implementing agencies um, across sectors. So really focusing on you know some of the sectors that that don't already do due diligence um, systematically and kind of you know crafting some key messages on why it's important and how they can do that um, so we we are looking for a few um, inputs and examples um, of how HLP intersects with other sectors um, how you all are doing due diligence um, on HLP so I'll drop a little form link in the chat if anyone has, any um, inputs they'd like to provide. Thanks, Jim. That's great, thanks. Um, thanks, Judy. And yes, look forward to sharing those uh, resources when they're ready as well. Um, great, and thanks for sharing the link. Um, yes, over to you, Dagna Chu, please. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, like you have uh, mentioned earlier, uh, in the northern part of the country where there has been dispute over a couple of years. Now the people are trying to go back to their place of origin, but there are also a lot of HLP issues are being reported. We have also tried to uh, look into some uh, issues depending on the report cases. Uh, there is a clear need, like you mentioned, for HLP intervention, and most of the issue are a little bit complicated due to the very nature of the dispute itself. And uh, there are also no formally operating civil structures uh, which are reinstalled in those places. And the 10 year security documents are all destroyed in those places. And uh, it seems a little bit uh, complicated and multifaceted, but uh, we have also witnessed. Uh, the very importance of HLP intervention, which will be much more better if, uh, I mean, the international experts who have more technical 
background in the area can also do some assessment and uh, provide some concrete documentation on the way forward will be very much important. And thank you. It's just to give you this uh, note and over to you. Thanks so much. Yeah, and providing some valuable extra kind of context and detail for that. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, we'll 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 um, uh, look to to share more about about the the, uh, the Ethiopia um, situation in the in the coming coming meetings as well. Um, but yeah, thanks for that um, for that addition. Thank you. Um, okay, so we're just about at time. We have two minutes in case others want to share anything. You're very welcome. Um, something to mention just for those involved in the coordination. We'll have our um, our uh coordination catch up in october i'll be sending details around for that uh, where we can talk about that more kind of hpc related programming side of things um as well um but yes uh other than that i'll just leave it open for a minute um and also encourage you to put your cameras on one last time to say hello and goodbye um and thank you all for your inputs thank you for the presenters uh, thank you for the comments and the questions. And um, I will just again uh, put in uh, contact details and ability to line up and access the recent newsletter in case you haven't. Um, but yeah, thanks so much, everybody. And good to see you. And uh, yeah, till next time. Bye. bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye